In this video, I want to do yet another clarification based on some questions I've gotten about color spaces in Blender 5.0. I specifically want to address a comment talking about this copper teapot that I've used in my last couple of videos talking about color spaces. I had used this example of the copper teapot to demonstrate that when you change from the old Rec. 709, which we had in Blender 4.5, over to Rec. 2020 or Asus CG, that the copper teapot becomes more vibrant because it was defined through the metallic BSDF, specifically through the physical conductor mode. When we convert over to a new color space from Rec. 709, for instance, if I go to Rec. 2020, we're presented with this dialog box that says convert colors in all data blocks. However, the physical conductor is not defined by colors, it's defined by physical values that are measured from real world laboratory experiments that correspond to specific wavelength values. So I've received this question now a couple of times. When we see that dialog box, does it also convert colors that are defined through the physical conductor? One of the comments even went so far as to say that, that I chose a very bad example to demonstrate the change between Rec. 709 and Rec. 2020, and that if I had actually calibrated these values correctly, that there would be no change between the two color spaces. And I'm here to tell you that that is wrong. In fact, my use of the copper teapot, and then we're going to look at these flashlights here with colorized metals, was exactly a very good demonstration of how colors can possibly become more vibrant when you switch from Rec. 709, which is a smaller color space, to a larger color space. So let's dive in and take a look at this. If we come over now and we take a look at the CIE chromaticity diagram, we can see I've got the Rec. 709 color space in there. And for reference, we keep calling the Rec. 709 color space small because it encompasses only about 36% of the colors within the CIE chromaticity diagram. But you can see around the perimeter, we have wavelength values. These are pure wavelength values that correspond to different parts of the visible spectrum. Now, we can isolate some of those for pure red, green, and blue values. So the consensus values in nanometers for red is 650 nanometers, for green it's 530 nanometers, and for blue it's 470 nanometers. And these are absolute real world values. They're independent of a color space. Now, since we have these reference red, green, and blue wavelengths, we can determine what the extinction coefficient and complex IOR values are that we can use in the physical conductor. So, for instance, we would come over to something like refractiveindex.info, and this is a repository of laboratory measured values for various materials. And in this particular case, we can look up a whole boatload of metals that have been measured in the laboratory. And you can see that there are these sort of complex charts right here, but when you look, you can see that we have refractive index and we have extinction coefficient. So all we have to do is punch in the specific wavelengths. Now, we're working with an RGB renderer in cycles. And so all we need are just these three reference values. So for copper, then, I would get the red values and I would come up to wavelength here and it, it's doing it in fractions. So I would put 0.650 and return, and it tells me that these are the laboratory measured complex IOR values, IOR plus extinction, for red. So I would take these values and we would come back over to Blender. We would have the physical conductor and I would put in that value for red. So it's red, green, and blue. So this is the IOR value. And then we would come back and we would get the extinction value and we would put that in for red extinction. Now we would do the same thing for the next green, which is 530. So then we would come back here and we would type 530 and it would produce laboratory measured values that we would do the same thing. We would take these back over and put them in. And then finally we would go to 470 for blue and we would get the extinction values for blue. So this is how I defined the copper for the example renderings of that copper teapot that I used. Now, the rendering process goes like this. 
The physical conductor takes these laboratory measured values and then it calculates the color for the object as the ray tracing process goes on for every incidence angle on that object. That color is then finally passed over to the color space. And if it exceeds the color space, then it is compressed into the color space. So that is why the copper teapot looks less saturated. It looks more dull in the Rec. 709 version because the colors are outside of the Rec. 709 color space for each of those RGB wavelengths. So you can see the red at 650 nanometers, it gets compressed over to the closest color within Rec. 709. Green travels quite a distance and then the blue travels the least distance. And that's going to come into play when we look at an example here in a minute. But when we look at Rec. 2020, an ACES CG would be similar, but we'll use Rec. 2020 right here. Rec. 2020's primaries all lie right on the boundary of the color space. And so they're basically pure wavelengths. So they travel just a very small distance to fit with inside of the Rec. 2020 color space. So there's very little clipping or compression inside of that color space. And that's why the copper teapot looks more vibrant within the Rec. 2020 color space. So to state this another way, when we convert from Rec. 709 to Rec. 2020, that conversion dialog box does absolutely nothing to the physical conductor values because those are based on real world nanometer wavelengths for those particular red, green, and blue colors. It's only after those colors are generated by the physical conductor that they are then compared and fit to within sight of the color space that you're using. And so you can see that even for Rec. 709, even though it doesn't have an absolutely pure wavelength value for its blue, it's pretty close to both the Rec. 2020 and the boundary of the color space. So it travels just a very small distance. So blues will change a little bit, but not as much as red, which will change more. But green is the one that will change the most. That's what the theory would predict. So let's take a look at another rendering that will demonstrate that. So when we take a look at these colorized metal flashlights, this is Rec. 709 and this is being displayed through sRGB. So these colors are defined through the physical conductor. At the end of this, I'm going to show you how I manually defined these. But if we come over now and we change over to Rec. 2020 for our working space, what you're going to see is that blue will change a little bit, red will change more, but the green will change the most, and then we get this. So that's exactly what we saw. Let me go back to Rec. 709 and then back to Rec. 2020. So put another way, Rec. 2020 is allowing the colors from these physically defined wavelengths to express themselves more correctly in the larger working space. Now let's come over and take a look at this physical conductor. I've done a video on this before, but I just want to show you how it is that I figured out these specific colors. So the way that this works is each of these fields corresponds to RGB. IOR is very similar to the index of refraction we use in the principle of BSDF to define the strength of glossy reflections. But the values are also a little bit different, and frequently you're going to see, if you define these in physical ways from refractiveindex.info, you're going to see IOR values that can drop below 1.0. That's very easy for that to happen. So these values are actually going to not be entirely intuitive if you're just used to using standard index of refraction values. And the extinction coefficient is something that you'll just have no reference for. And it's just a value that determines how quickly wavelengths are basically absorbed into a material. It's kind of an abstraction, but typically, again, you're just getting these from laboratory measured values, so you don't really have to have a deep understanding about what they are. But if you're trying to define these yourself, the way that you define it in, in sort of an easy way to understand is that for in this particular case, red, green, and blue, you can see that in both cases for the IOR and for the extinction, they have the highest value, and thus we get a blue material, whereas red and green are the lower values. So that's basically how it works. If I come over here and I touch the red object and we make sure that we're using the correct material for that, the basic, you can see it's exactly the same. Red has the highest value, 
green and blue are lower, red in extinction is higher, and green and blue are lower. So if, once you kind of know that general rule, you can go in and you can play with these values to define different types of materials. So if I wanted to come down here and change this value to 2.5, and I wanted to bring this up to something higher, do you see how I changed that to become more purple back here? So if you wanted to find metals this way, that's kind of the approach you could use. And again, the physical conductor is going to allow the reflectivity of these surfaces to behave just in a more physically accurate way. But what you don't know is you don't know what kind of wavelengths these values belong to. But if all you're doing is just defining these to get a metallic color, then you can totally do that. So I hope that this video helps to demonstrate why the physical conductor is a bit of an outlier, it's a bit of an oddball in terms of color generation that is not governed by a change from one color space to another, but that it benefits from going from a smaller color space to a larger color space.